Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our RimWorld adventure in the tropical rainforest with the Believers of Boyo. Last time we left off after turning Psycaster Light into a Sanguophage, Age, and we also completed a mission for more information about the Staff of Sin. However, during that mission we encountered a group of mechanoids, two infestations and a pirate raid, and paired with two mental breaks happening during all of that, I think we got lucky that everyone made it out alive. Now, today we begin things with some rearrangements to our hospital. After completing the microelectronics research near the end of the last episode, we now have access to the comms console, and I think that's going to be an important device for us going forward, especially in conjunction with an orbital trade beacon, because as you can see, the goods inside of our storage room are piling up again, and having access to orbital traders would be a great additional way to make some money. Now, at this point, we are also putting down a high-tech research bench, also unlocked by the microelectronics research, and if we want to unlock transport pods next, as many of you have suggested in the comments, then we actually need this, as this is a technology that cannot be unlocked at a simple research bench. However, even with the high-tech research bench, we can't unlock it just yet, as it unfortunately requires both machining and biofuel refining to be unlocked first. So let's get started with machining here, that also unlocks a few other things that might be generally useful, and with Kevin and Sanguophage Volek researching simultaneously, it should be quickly completed. Moving on then, we are taking care of something that is perhaps long overdue. Over the course of various quests, we have collected a grand total of 9 gun turrets, and today we are installing all of those at the northern perimeter, protected by granite walls and barricades. This should hopefully give us a bit of extra firepower against enemies coming from that direction, and since our base is located close to the southwestern edge of the map, most of them will. In the middle of the night then, another elephant joins us as Countess Rotona gives birth, and as usual in this situation we are looking at the patron naming rights tier, and so this time the elephant calf is named Azazi, and uh, let me know in the comments below what kind of royal prefix you would like us to give her. So far we already have the Earl of Bronze, Countess Rotona and Duke Kalanur, and also Slaughterbush, but I think I'd like to leave that as it is, so let me know what Azazi's full name should be. As the sun then rises again, I think it's time to talk a bit about Dimitri. In last episode's comments, it seemed to me like most of you were in favor of recruiting Dimitri and making him a permanent part of the colony instead of just letting him go. And I think I would have to agree with that. Skills-wise, he fills two very important roles with animals and medical. As you can see, he is also fairly well-liked and has made a few friends in the colony. That is, except for Wyatt, but honestly, who likes Wyatt? And finally, there is one rather important thing about him that we have not yet talked about, and that's the fact that he is only 17 years young. And so ultimately, I just don't feel like the believers of Boyo would be comfortable with sending a 17-year-old out to live on his own, which is why we are indeed going to recruit Dimitri. Now, unfortunately, there is no way to actually begin recruiting someone while they are still a slave, so instead we are forced to imprison Dimitri, which I have to say does feel a bit weird, considering that we are actually trying to reward Dimitri with this. Now, we'll get back to that in just a moment. For now, we have Maniac being chased by a man-hunting elephant. Luckily, though, this time there is some distance between him and the animal, so he is comfortably able to outrun it and to lure it into our trap. And with that, let's go back to Dimitri, and as you can see, in order to recruit him, we now have to reduce his resistance. So despite him being at least half a member of the colony over the last few episodes, making friends and being generally productive, he will now most likely have to spend pretty much the entire episode in prison, as reducing a resistance rating of 13 is not going to be an easy task, even for someone as skilled as Kevin. So if any of you happen to know of a mod that perhaps allows us to already begin recruiting people while they are still slaves, then I would appreciate if you let me know in the comments down below. I just feel like it's something that kind of messes up the whole idea of having people repent for their sins. So what I'm looking for is essentially just a way to start reducing people's resistance while they are still slaves, because at this point the game is actually treating Dimitri as if he was just captured, which again in this scenario just doesn't feel right to me. Now, at this point, back to our turrets. As you can see, we are currently setting up power for them, and we are going with a tried and tested method here, simply hooking them all up to a switch behind the wall, so that we can flick them on and off as needed. 
As the night then sets in and we have everything hooked up to the grid, it is time for another infestation, this time spawning right inside of our temple, and as a result now also putting Dimitri into harm's way. So as we now set up our defenses, we have light carry Dimitri out of here. I think we will make our stand right here at the entrance to our temple. This strikes me as a good choke point and should allow light to use his berserk pulse to cause a good amount of carnage. In the meantime, Kevin takes over Dimitri, and a few moments later the first bugs are hatching. And the plan here is actually quite simple. We are using Berserk Balls on the Mega Spiders to keep the insects occupied with each other for as long as possible. Whatever gets too close to us is hopefully quickly shredded by Wyatt and Kyle, especially with Maniac throwing in the occasional stun sidecast too. And so, while the fight might be lengthy, it is not particularly dangerous. We definitely also got a bit lucky here with the spawn location of this group, but after a good hour of fighting, the room is almost already fully cleared. Now, we do have another small group of insects trying to dig their way out of one of our prison cells. However, just as we clear a path for them, just to speed this up a bit, Brandon returns. As you might recall, he was on another brief excursion with the Empire and has now gathered enough honor to advance to the rank of Knight, but first, let's take care of the bugs, which are thankfully quickly dispatched of. And just as the infestation comes to an end, we receive yet another quest. This time, the Empire wants us to house two of their prisoners for six days. An easy task and actually quite fitting for us, considering they are sick with blood rot. So we will do our best to take care of them and also receive some more honor as a reward. For now though, it's time to clean up our base a little bit, even though most of our colonists should probably be asleep by now. But still, we have more action happening, even if this time it's only a group of travelers with a few items to trade, we'll definitely take care of them once they arrive. Speaking of taking care, Kevin now patching up Wyatt's injuries, which are thankfully not too plentiful. And just in that moment, Kevin, Squeaks, Kyle and Ellie come down with fibrous mechanites, which can be a blessing and a curse, as it gives a noticeable increase to manipulation and movement speed, but also makes the pawn tire out faster and causes a decent amount of pain. The latter obviously not too problematic in our case, as pain is actually idealized in our ideology. Still, we will now have to deal with this for as long as it lasts, the disease cannot be cured and will eventually have to go away on its own, and so the following day is spent mostly doing cleanup and repair work, the influx of insect meat obviously great to see, as our pawns do like themselves a good bite of bug. A short moment later, we are then also officially informed about Brandon's night ceremony, or rather about what's currently missing to perform it. As you can see, we need ourselves a harp, and that one is locked behind some research, so it will be a few more days until Brandon officially receives his next title. In the meantime, Kevin can quickly trade with our tribal visitors before they leave again, and acquiring some more herbal medicine strikes me as a good idea, considering that we already have four patients to treat with fibrous mechanites and will acquire two more shortly with blood rot. For that reason, we are also quickly plopping down another small herbal medicine growing zone, most likely just for one harvest, but I fear that otherwise our supplies will be stretched a bit too thin. Let us also not forget about the still ongoing efforts to convert Sanguophage Volek from his cannibal ideology. Slowly but steadily we are making progress, and I have high hopes that we will see him as a believer of Boyo in this episode. I also have hopes that Kevin will be able to at least somewhat quickly plow through Dimitri's resistance. The two of them have a solid, but not great relationship, and so with each attempt Kevin should be able to chip off one to one and a half points. A few hours later then, our youngest, Ellie, receives a trade inspiration, and her social skill is also advancing, I think she's at level 4 or 5 at the moment, so perhaps the next time a caravan arrives, a 6-year-old will be our negotiator. On the next morning at least, we can already see Ellie playing around with the comms console. That is another way for her to satisfy her learning need, which I think is on a great path, she is already at growth tier 6 out of 8, and I'm pretty sure that we should get to at least 7 before she ages up. A few hours later then, the machining research is finally completed, so we now have access to the machining table, and while we could now continue with biofuel refining to eventually unlock transport parts, I think we will go with the harp first. Not only should that be a very quick project to complete, but it will also give us the option to have a knight and thus to trade with the Empire, which is in some ways why we are hoping to unlock transport parts in the first place. Speaking of the Empire, it is now also time to accept the prisoner quest, but this time we are giving the honor to Kevin. I think the believers of Boyo would be content with getting someone to the rank of knight because of the trade with the Empire perk, but I just don't see them strive for the absolute highest ranks of royalty. 
That is why we are now giving a few points of honor to Kevin, who honestly has been doing so much work behind the scenes to keep this colony together. All of his researching and doctoring is not always the most exciting stuff to show off, but I think he has earned himself some honor, quite literally. Not to mention that advancing him to the rank of knight would also make some sense, since he is our best trader. In the afternoon then, it's time for another event, a manhunting pack of panthers, 83 of them. And you know, I think we're just not going to bother with them at all for the time being. If we just close our doors and do not let anyone wander around outside, they should eventually leave on their own. That is, if we make sure they don't break down any doors in the meantime. And so, with panthers roaming around outside, we are building some beds inside, keeping in mind that our two bloodrot prisoners are still that, prisoners, and so they will now stay in here for the next six days until the Empire comes back to pick them up. During that time, we can of course do our best to convert them. We could of course also use them as hemogen farms for our sanguophages, but I just don't feel like that's something the believers of Boyo would do. So instead, we will try to make them see our ways, and if we succeed, we will also receive one ideology development point per prisoner. First of all though, one of our two prisoners goes berserk and attempts to break out, so we are sending in Kyle with his thrombohorn to pacify her. Let's hope he doesn't outright kill her as that would fail the quest, but then again he is no Wyatt and hopefully shows a bit more restraint. And indeed, there we are, our prisoner is down, heavily injured but still alive and can now be put back into bed, and Kevin is quick on the scene to administer some medicine. A few hours later then, our researchers unlock the harp, and with that we can now perform Brandon's night ceremony. And it also means that we can now go back on the path towards transport parts with biofuel refining. Just as Kevin then extracts a bit more hemogen to keep our sangophages going, we receive the good news that marriage is on between Squeaks and Took. So it looks like this time around the two of them are serious, and who knows, maybe they even have another baby on the way soon too. Wyatt, meanwhile, is using a temporary crafting spot to make a harp. Yes, we could have also constructed a smithy for this, but it does not take that much longer here. And it also gives him a bit more extra experience for his crafting skill. A short while later then, we have good news and bad news. The good, Vulek has received a trade inspiration. The bad, we are under attack by tribes people, three groups of them to be exact. One of them, however, also including Kevin's sister. Now, as you can see, the groups are quite large, with about 35 attackers in each of them. However, we also still have 83 man-hunting panthers on the map, and considering that our enemies are fairly poorly protected tribes people, I think the animals will have the upper hand here. So I guess let's just sit back and watch the carnage unfold and see how this goes. Right, just a few minutes after the fight has begun, the first group is already fleeing. The Panthers are suffering a good number of losses too, it seems, and I would bet that a healthy number of them are going to bleed out over the next few hours. However, for the moment, they are clearly winning this. Case in point, the second group is now fleeing too. And with the sun slowly setting over the jungle, group number three is sent packing too, and so we didn't have to lift a single finger, apart perhaps from some minor repairs to our exterior wall. Now, on a positive note, Kevin's sister did actually survive, albeit barely. She is pretty, 19 years old and good at fighting. And because she is Kevin's sister, I think she deserves to be rescued. And thankfully, Vulek can get in and out, or rather out and in if you will, before the Panthers do anything to him. Kevin's sister, however, in critical condition, bleeding out in just one hour, so I think we're using the coagulate ability here to save her. This immediately tends every single of her wounds, and that means we can now safely put her in a prison cell without having to worry about her survival. On the next morning then, just as we are taking a closer look at Ellie's skills, we receive another quest. This one, the probably already familiar spacecraft hack, a part of the questline for the Staff of Sin, shouldn't be too difficult, but obviously we do want to wait until the Panthers are gone, otherwise this could get a bit messy. And so instead, we sit and watch as Light and Ellie try to convince Dimitri to join us. Light's not quite as effective at this as Kevin is, but our head doctor does have his hands full at the moment, so I assume he'll be glad about any relief he can get. Speaking of relief, our enemies also dropped 25 units of herbal medicine, very fitting considering the situation we are currently in. As Kevin then goes back to recruiting Dimitri, Wyatt finishes making the harp, and so it is quickly installed in our common room, and with that we would now be ready for Brandon's night ceremony, if only it weren't for the panther still running around. 
So instead of a royal ceremony, we finished the day with a conversion ritual. The target is Kyle, and we are hoping for a masterful outcome. The chances of that happening are about 1 in 5, but it will be the only way to actually convert him. Unfortunately, Kyle is steadfast and thus loses certainty so so slowly that even if we cast Kevin's conversion ability on him every 3 days, it will just not be enough. And well, it also looks like we won't have to, because indeed it was a masterful conversion. We did already try this once, two or three episodes ago, and that time we failed. Now, however, Kyle has been converted to the Believers of Boyo, and we also earned two additional ideology development points. That also means that Kyle's mood is most likely going to rise again very soon, and so another successful day comes to an end. On the next morning, Maniac kills the last remaining panther, and with that we are now also ready for Brandon's night ceremony. So let us invite the royal bestower once more. Obviously a different person than last time, keep in mind that one died after picking a fight with their guards. This one however still very much alive and now honoring Brandon with the title of knight, which I think is as high as we will go in this series. Again, I don't really see a point in pursuing royalty too much. And there we go, a grandiose bestowing ceremony comes to an end and Brandon receives two points of extra honor as a reward. He has now earned a few more privileges, but might also develop a few more demands. The most important thing however is that we now have a colonist who can officially trade with the Empire, and that could be very very useful indeed. Now for Psycasts, we don't really have that many great choices here, but I think we'll go with Vertigo Pulse. Word of Love always felt a little abusive to me. I think the Believers of Boyo definitely like to see themselves as good Samaritans, but I don't think they would go that far and force other people to love each other. Now in the afternoon we can watch Kyle take care of some corpse disposal. Fortunately though, just in that moment it is starting to rain. But on the bright side, we have now finished researching biofuel refining, and that means we can finally start working on transport parts. However, expect that research to progress a little slower than the previous three. For those three, we could utilize all three of our research benches. For this one, we can only use the high-tech one, and thus only one person will be able to research at a time. Somewhat fittingly then, Kevin's sister suffers a crisis of faith, and as a result, her belief in her current ideology has been drastically reduced, so I think we should be able to convert her soon, despite the fact that she only loses certainty at 40% of the rate that others do. And while we watch Kevin do his nightly conversion rounds, we do indeed see that Squeaks is pregnant once more, so another child is hopefully going to join the Believers of Boyo soon. Let's hope that Took and Squeaks can stay together for the entirety of the childhood this time. On the next morning then, we are sending out Kyle together with Light, because as you can see, Kyle currently has the highest hacking speed of all of our colonists. Light accompanies him because he has access to the skip sidecast and every second counts, as we are now accepting the space drone hacking quest. This the second of five quests we need to complete to acquire the Staff of Sin, and with a rough idea of where that space drone is going to land, we can now skip Kyle closer to it, so that he can begin hacking as soon as the space drone lands. And that is how we are going to spend the next 8 or so hours, after which we will have raiders arriving, which could actually become problematic as these raiders are impits, and that means they can spit fire and our vampires are not going to like that. A few hours later then, Kyle is about halfway done with the hack and we have a defense force assembled, and just in time because we now have 55 tribal impits trying to get to the space drone. Hopefully though we can fend them off before they get to it, thus allowing Kyle to continue researching in peace. And so we are setting up an ambush near the remains of our first small mountain shelter. And as the first enemies arrive and the shooting begins, we are once again making heavy use of light. With our attackers clustered this closely together, they are prime targets for Berserk Pulse. It won't last forever, but it should keep them occupied with each other for a few minutes. And well, light is so powerful he can cast it three times in a row with little trouble. And so the Impets now start spewing fire, but for the time being mostly at each other. In the meantime, we can easily shoot them in the back, but eventually the Berserk Pulse comes to an end and we have enemies coming towards us. This now marks a good point to retreat a bit, but still the fighting does get a bit hectic shortly afterwards. In my experience, unless you specifically plan for them, the whole fire spewing thing does make Impets one of the most annoying enemies to fight in the game. So the idea here is very much to let our enemies soak up some of that damage. Obviously our bears and elephants are not fireproof, but they can take the beating while we fire from the backlines. 
Also, just in case you're wondering, yes, we could have tried to lure these guys towards our turrets, but there is no guarantee they actually would have come close enough. They might have also just turned right towards the space drone, which I just wanted to avoid at all costs. And, well, it was a bit messy, but the plan worked. Kyle here should also comfortably be able to finish hacking the space drone before the next wave arrives. However, time is of the essence for Grizzly Bear Level Boy, as well as for Light, who just collapsed inside of the ruins. Now, Light won't die, he is a deathless sanguophage after all, and Level Boy also still has a few hours left, which makes this even more heartbreaking. I am honestly not quite sure what caused it, the timer did say 5 hours left until he dies, but it seems like Grizzly Bear Level Boy has succumbed to his wounds, maybe all the fire and burning was just a bit too much, either way, he will be sorely missed as part of our fuzzy defense force, and so just a short while later we have dug a grave down by the river. Just in that moment then, a light scarless gene kicks in for the first time and guess which scar it healed? Yes, the one that hampered him most, the one on his brain. So just as an eclipse sets across the jungle, light is going to be a whole lot more useful, once he wakes back up again that is. In the meantime, Kyle finishes the space drone hack and thus completes the quest, while Squeaks buries the body of Grizzly Bear Level Boy in his final resting place. 30 seconds later, the space drone then explodes, leaving behind uranium and components, and we are one step closer to obtaining the powerful Staff of Sin. Now, at this point, let's quickly jump back to Brandon. As a knight, he is now a level 3 Psycaster, and I said that we are not going to advance him any further. What I meant by that was to not advance him any further in royal ranks. We can still very much improve his Psycasting, though, as we do have two Silent Neuroformers still lying around. And with the first, advancing him to level 4, I think we are going to grab a word of serenity. This is basically the anti-mental break psychast. Cast this on anyone suffering from a mental break and they will stop immediately. No need to imprison them and to risk any further mood penalties. Depending on the severity of the mental break though, it does cost quite a lot of psi focus. But still, it can be worth it, especially in situations where people like to kill each other. Now, we're not done yet, we have another Neuroformer and there is no point in not using it. Level 5, after all, does have some of the most useful psychasts in the entire game. And even though I had hoped for Far Skip to make Brandon our dedicated caravan trader, I did mention a few episodes ago that I would like to give him a few of the combat psychasts, and Psychic Grenade is one of those. Basically works like a regular grenade, with the same stopping power and all, I believe. But unlike grenades, can be used alongside an already equipped weapon, although I think we're going to switch Brandon to an Altex staff sooner or later. This is what the Psycast then looks like in action, a bit underwhelming perhaps, but trust me, it will get the job done. On the next morning then, the jungle's still dark due to the eclipse, it is time to bring in the next mushroom harvest. And we also have great news from the prison cells, as the first of our guests has just been converted to the believers of Boyo. This gives us another ideology development point, and I think two more will follow shortly. However, while we are now putting up a machining table in our small workshop over here, one of our prisoners unfortunately goes berserk again. This time, however, we have the Word of Serenity Psycast, and enough psi focus on Brandon to cast it, and so the berserk rage comes to an end almost immediately, even though it did just completely empty out Brandon's psi focus meter. So this definitely something you should probably only do with high priority targets. In this case, however, our prisoners actually are that, because if we lose one of them fighting off the Berserk Rage, we also fail the entire quest, and that would very much not be the way of Boyo. In the middle of the night, Brandon then also experiences a creativity inspiration, so we'll have to think about what we're going to use that on. With a construction skill of 14 and a crafting skill of 11, he should definitely be able to make something nice. Before he goes to work though, it's time to give him something else to wear. The Eltex gear here not only makes him a more useful psycaster, but also fulfills the clothing requirement of his royal rank. Yes, some of it is tattered, some of it is tainted, but still I think he'll live with that. Despite it all, he now looks pretty magnificent, so let's round out the outfit with a nice Eltex staff. At least in terms of psycasting, that should now vastly improve his abilities. Back to the prison cells then we go and we have another ideology development point waiting for us, as the second of our blood rot prisoners has just successfully been converted. Now we completed those conversions just in time, because as you can see, a few hours later the Imperial shuttle lands to pick up our two prisoners, and just in that moment Squeaks also successfully tames another elephant. After all, we have to make up for the loss of Grizzly Bear Level Boy somehow, and so we now do so with Iliont the Elephant, once again named after a patron supporter from the naming rights tier and above, and once again I am open for suggestions regarding his royal title. 
With our two prisoners on board, the shuttle then leaves again and we complete the quest. Kevin gains the title of Freeholder, but until he reaches the rank of Knight, he still has a long way to go. Jumping ahead a few hours, it is now the middle of the night and Kevin is once again doing his rounds and this time he successfully converts his sister and as a result we are now up to 11 ideology development points, which somewhat sparks the question which meme we should pick next. For example, there might be an argument to be made in favor of the new blood feeding meme, proselytizer could also be fitting, although it does not have that much of an impact. Maybe we could also go with something like flesh purity to contrast the popular choice of transhumanist which I think I would rather not touch in this series. At the moment, I think I would like to leave that for a truly high-tech playthrough that can fully explore all of its options. But as always, let me know in the comments what you think we should go with. As we jump right ahead to the next big moment of the series, Dimitri has finally lost all of his resistance and has decided to join us for good this time. And so we welcome our Itakin Night Owl back into our ranks, and so to wrap up the episode, we should now probably also briefly talk about what to do with Kevin's sister. We could obviously send her down the same path that Dimitri walked, enslaving her to repent for attacking us. We could also just straight up attempt to recruit her immediately, or we could simply release her to make her find her own path. Once again, let me know in the comments what you think we should do, and as always, let's end the episode with some fan art, starting us off with another three pieces by Isaac Young. The first one here depicting Sanguophage Volek walking up to Light and turning him into a Sanguophage, seemingly without any prior information or consent. Artwork number two features Maniac being judged by the colony. Because, well, Maniac did not exactly make last episode's mission any easier. Mental breaking in the worst possible moment, and not only that, mental breaking and deciding to kill Kyle. So I think he's lucky he's got his title of Mournful Miner back after all of that. Artwork number three, meanwhile, features another lengthy explanation that you can find in the comments down below, and it depicts the happy family, Squeaks, Ellie and Took, with the three of them stargazing at night after a long day of work. Absolutely lovely, but we are not done just yet. We also have three submissions by YTHP, all three of them featuring Wyatt in different stages of his life. The first one, titled Kaidoa's Close, depicting Wyatt's capture by the Cult of Jinx in our previous series. Number two, simply titled Wyatt, showing him after converting to the Cult of Jinx and receiving his new name, and also wielding a Thrombohorn, his weapon of choice until the Cult of Jinx recovered the Plasma Sword Redhawk. And that plasma sword then also prominently featured in this rendition titled The Red Devil, a nickname that he may have received from his enemies, and I have to say, with good reason. And with that, we are now officially at the end of an episode that turned out a little longer than I had expected. If you enjoyed it, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up, and if you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can of course also go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.